all her photographs will testify to this. She worked really hard and she wanted each shot to be different. And I think that exhausted her. The agencies just didn't understand to take care of the mental health of the girls. I think that upped her game into drugs. And I would never have understood that then because we were all working hard. There was a lot of stress on us. Sandy Linter is the queen of disco beauty. She invented the iconic beauty looks during the Studio 54 heyday in New York City, defining the look of an era. She is often referenced as the dear friend and romantic partner of the late model Gia Karanji, whose supermodel stardom led her on the fast track to drug use, AIDS, and a tragic early death. Prior to the interview, I revisited the movie Gia, which landed Angelina Jolie a Golden Globe and Emmy Award for her leading performance. But Sandy's work in beauty spans beyond the tragedy, one that has impacted almost every major fashion publication in the world. She's worked with legendary models like Christy Brinkley, Elizabeth Hurley, and Brooke Shields, just to name a few, and has also authored books like Disco Beauty, Nighttime Makeup, and The Makeup Wake Up, revitalizing your look at any age, and was recently honored and featured at the Brooklyn Museum Studio 54 Night Magic Exhibit. She's a legend, but most of all, she's a kind and brilliant human being. Take a listen. Welcome to a fashion moment, Sandy. I know you have so much going on. Brooklyn Museum, that exhibit launching, which must be amazing for you. Like, what was it like to see your work in an actual museum? Oh. (laughs) Yeah. Next question. (laughs) I know. No. I mean... I, I mean, just delving into your work and, and just seeing like all that you've accomplished. You know, I was born in 1985. So, you know, th- this was like before my time, but just digging through and just seeing all of your accomplishments. I mean, I, I, I'm blown away by just what you've contributed to the industry, to culture, American culture, and, and just the way that we live our lives. So, Thank you. And it is much deserved. And I cannot wait to, to see the exhibit and also get the get all the materials. I want all the materials. Oh, you, have to go, you have to go to the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's now why did you stop with I'm the sorry. <laughs> I know, I know that wasn't I know that wasn't on the list you of know, questions. The only thing that makes me cry is when you talk about my work. Uh, it's the only thing because <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And you still do. And you know what's so interesting? You know, I I love your videos. I, I've just been watching a million of them. <laughs> I watch all of your videos. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you, you did ask me some interesting questions. I remember... Um, you said, how did I establish myself in the industry? Yeah. And the, the thing is, I've never um, handed out a card. I've never in my life. The only uh, time I ever started to work my business was when I got on Instagram in 2013. Wow. And that's when I called myself Sandy Linter Makeup because nobody knew who I was. So I really had to come in kind of strong. Mm-hmm. And I did. And I started putting, I didn't understand that they wanted to see the vintage pictures. Yes. And once I knew that, well, <laughs> that got me a load of fans. And then, of course, my connection with Gia would yeah. always bring me a lot of recognition. Absolutely. Um, the shoot that was the most powerful of my career was the shoot that um, I did 
with Chris von Wagenheim and with Gia because it changed my life. Wow. And, uh, you know, thinking about her, one thing I want to say is that when she worked, when she was in front of the camera, the few times that I worked with her, and you can see all her photographs will testify to this, she worked really hard. And yeah. she wanted each shot to be different. And I think that exhausted her. And in those days, the agencies just didn't understand to take care of the mental health of the girls. And so mentally, she was worn out. And I think that upped her game into drugs. And so I would never have been that. I'm looking back 40 years, and now I understand what happened, but I would never have understood that then because we were all working hard. There was a lot of stress on us. Wow. And so, um, anyway, so that's... Yeah. Absolutely. It was, it was a different time. Um, definitely, you know, uh, just being the first woman to be on record of having AIDS. I mean, it was such a transition the first, period. Um, the first well-known woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, there were many women dying of AIDS, but we didn't know it. Yeah. So I think she also felt a little protected by that. It was only, and then <clears throat> when it came to intravenous drug users, I pointed that out to her. Oh, wow. And, a response well you know you know I, I know that there were you know a lot of you know very difficult times uh during that period and your relationship with her what would you say just overall was one of the biggest lessons that you learned from her and just from being with her about life and and you uh, love she, she just she went for it whatever it was she went for it um, whoever she wanted to be, she tried to be with that person. I mean, <laughs> you know, she, she really, uh, was just a little sweet girl from Philly who was extraordinarily beautiful mm. and gifted in front of the camera. And, but she went for it. She went for it. She, she got the covers. She got the accolades. And nothing stopped her except mentally. She got yeah, moved. absolutely. So where where did you grow up, I and grew, like where are you from? That, I'm born in Brooklyn, 1947. Grew up wow. in Ireland. I it was a great place to grow up, but I could not wait to leave and come <laughs> to Manhattan. I got to Manhattan when I was about 17, 18 years old, and I shared an apartment with a girlfriend and it was $145 a month, which we wow. Saw. And it was a five floor walk up on 87th <laughs> street and first Avenue. <laughs> and, and those were the days. So. Oh, I know your legs look great with the fifth floor walk up. My goodness. <laughs> Even at the age of 18, that was tough. <laughs> absolutely absolutely so you know i i know in one of your previous uh interviews you were sort of mentioning like people you know like makeup artists were there but it wasn't really like a big thing you know like there were only a few of you all there it wasn't a business at all and and so i went to the kenneth salon i started at bloomingdale's behind the counter and I love being around makeup and I love putting it on people. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I just enjoyed. And people would stop by the counter and say, oh, I like what you're wearing. Sell me that. So I sold them whatever the millions of things that I had on my face. And so when Mr. Kenneth came by one evening, I just said, I'd love to work in your salon when you have a space. And that was it. And that was my networking skills. And so I got into Mr. Kenneth, and he did every society woman in New York City. And wow. one of them was Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Oh. And so it, 
it, my one of my very first clients was Jacqueline Kennedy on NASA. So when you say, how did you establish yourself as a makeup artist? Well, hello, Mr. Kenneth. When you have a spot, will you hire me? Okay. Wow. Yeah. Who is your first, one of your first clients? The most famous woman in the world. Then I did the beauty editor of Vogue magazine. She did a two-page article about me. And, you know. The rest was history. That's it. Then you get to work with the likes of a Deborah Turbeville, wow. who was the most astonishing photographer I've ever worked with. One of them. It was like doing a movie every single day you work with Deborah. She'd take you to some weird odd <laughs> place. And, you know, the girls, were, oh, we always picked up her vibe. She never told us what to do. And being a makeup artist, it's so important because you can grow like that. So you're working with a genius photographer who's not directing you. She's not telling you ever what to do. So even if it's a five-day shoot for Vogue, you know when she likes it because you know when you're making the photographer happy. Wow. But she's not, to, oh, no, no, I want less of that or less of that. No, no, no. There was never a discussion. It was never... So she just uh, took us along for this wonderful, wonderful ride. I love it. You know, what was your very first fashion cover? The very well, first the first, fashion cover. The, the very first one was Vogue with Scabulo. And the oh. model was uh, Karen Graham, oh. who eventually got all the Estee Lauder ads. And she is that drop dead gorgeous woman in all the 1970s. Ads that everyone wanted to look like Karen Graham. Oh, that is absolutely amazing. I'm sure you were able to meet so many people throughout your career. I, I would assume that you probably worked with like every top model photographer, like was their favorite. <laughs> in my in my lifespan as a makeup artist, yes. My wow. really strongest lifespan as it was the first 10 years. So I'd say from 74 till 84. And then that wow. was really strong. And then after that, you had to network to get jobs. And it was a skill I didn't have. I didn't develop. I, I just got shy when it would come to me handing out a card. <laughs> or being yeah. Photograph with another person. I just pulled back. Yeah. But I... Stop doing that when I found it. That's right. That's right. And you had to tell everyone, hello, I am not Debbie Harry. I am Sandy Linter. You look so much like her. <laughs> she was another great moment in my career. I mean, wow. doing her makeup when she walked into the studio, the photographer and the art director were mumbling with each other. They thought she looked a little rough mm. and she sat down in front of me and I looked down at her and she looked up at me and I said, I got this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, we have to talk about disco. You know, I, I reached out to my colleagues. I said, I'm interviewing Sandy. Yes. Oh my goodness. Beauty. Disco beauty, the iconic so book. It's all back. Everything's uh, back. It's all back. I mean, the fashion, the beauty, it's just like we're doing it all over again. So I'm I'm curious, just for those who don't know, oh my gosh, I love it. Oh my gosh, we're gonna we're gonna put a link in the show notes so that everyone can see this amazing book and buy it. How would you describe <laughs> it? the book? Unfortunately, <laughs> reprinted. Yeah, yeah. It's you can like you know you might pay a pretty penny on eBay for it at this point. It's like five hundred dollars. I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of folks, uh, you know, some of the younger folks uh, who listen to the show may not know exactly what disco is. They may have like an idea or a concept from what they've seen on TV. But how would you describe disco in the disco era? Well, you just have to go to Netflix and <laughs> put on the documentary about Studio 54. I mean, I described it beautifully in the... Uh, documentary it was 
you know, you'd be waiting around outside. And I had a friend uh, named Howard Fugler, and he knew how to get behind me and push me through the crowd. So he used me as some kind of a battling ram or something. <laughs> he just pushed me right through the crowd, right through to the doorman. Once I got past the doorman, there was like a velvet carpet. It looked like a runway. Wow. It was mirrored on either side. There was a coat room on the right. I just threw my coat. I, they gave me a ticket. I never lost my coat, but I never cared. So, and then you'd hear the music was on the left, and it was crazy times. Oh, my goodness. And I, I have to know, who were you wearing during that period? Oh, this is interesting. So the first time I went, I wore Fiorucci, and it was a <gasps> fabulous big turquoise blue skirt. But I never felt great wearing a lot of clothes. Mm -hmm. I wore a Stephen Burroughs red slinky dress. Yeah. All off the shoulders. And the more, you know, everyone wore the slinky dresses. So the reason we wore the slinky dresses is because the sleeves would fall down and the skirts would rise up. And so you looked like you really weren't wearing clothing. Yeah. And that was the best way to look in Studio 54. It was, it was just the less that you looked like you had clothing on, the better you could get. <laughs> and so, you know, I one time wore a bathing suit to Studio 54, and that was photographed by two photographers in one night. Wow. Pretty rare because that was New Year's Eve of 1978. And wow. photographers were never in Studio 54, but that night they had let two of them in. I have the picture here. I love it. So this is it. <gasps> I'm wearing a baby. Yes. The, oh, such an iconic photo. So, love it. Anyway. It, wow. it was so much about, it was about the clothes. It really was. And it was about the way you moved in the clothes. Wow. And all the designers were into it. Everyone was into the body, the body shape. I mean, Calvin Klein was there every night. Um, I heard. Yeah. I heard from some of my colleagues. <laughs> yeah, every night. Um, so many people. I, I just missed bumping into Michael Kors as I was leaving the Brooklyn Museum. He was coming in and my friend said that I had just left and he's told Michael that he had just missed me. And he said, oh, whatever. Hello, whatever. But everyone went to Studio 54. There was no one in the fashion industry who didn't go to Studio 54. And so... You know, you have these fabulous clothes, you have this vibrant, you know, this vibrant time in the city. Like, where, like, how did you come up with the cons, the beauty concepts, like the colors, the shapes? Uh, would you like go home at night and just sort of like, you know, create? Oh, there was a lot of going home at night. There was a, no, this was how it was. So if <laughs> I was getting ready to go to studio, there was no, like going home at night. It was like this. <laughs> if I were getting ready to go to Studio 54, I would take out, you know, my array of makeup and powders, sometimes purchased from Il Maquillage or Stage Light, which had stage makeup. So that's the kind of stuff I had. I had all the glitter. I had all the powders. Mm. I was inspired by the European magazines and I was inspired by the clothing. I was inspired by color. And so I would be testing out everything on myself. Wow. And when I say everything, <laughs> I, everything was tested out on me. The colors, the blues, the pinks, the red, everything was tested. The glitter, all the glitter on my body, all on my face, in my hair. So, wow. yes, and on my friends. And, and my friends were hairdressers. Uh, Howard Fugler or Harry King would come over to my apartment and snatch up my hair and, yes. you know, do their thing. And, oh, they always changed whatever I was wearing. I was wearing not the, maybe it wasn't 
hot enough for them or whatever. <laughs> and so I was lucky because I was, and I was around these guys, hairdressers who loved photographing. And so they would always be taking Polaroids. And so I oh. had a collection of Polaroids. Oh so, my God. That's amazing. We need a book of those Polaroids at I'm some lucky, point. <laughs> very lucky to have those Polaroids. Thanks to my good friends. Oh, that is so, and you're still really great friends with Harry as well. Yes. Uh, it was his birthday the other day and that's why I couldn't get him to come back to do the Brooklyn museum with me, but I'll see him again at the end of the week. He was really, um, uh, the one of the greatest hairdressers that wow. ever lived. Wow. He, he was, and he was so easy to work with. And one of the reasons was why, I, it, say the, the model was Rene Russo or mm -hmm. Rosie Bella or Patty Hansen. He would just sit back like this and he goes, go ahead, Sam, you do the makeup. No <laughs> hairdresser does that. They all come in and they do the hair for one hour, two hours, maybe three hours. But Harry kind of understood that the face that I was going to do was going to direct his hair in a way. Yeah. And get away with a lot more adventurous hair and a lot more extreme hair, which is what he wanted to do. So he was really, really smart like that. And I appreciated it. Because I would come in all hot and ready to go. And then it's hard to lay back for a couple of hours. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it sounds like, you know, uh, uh, relationships are so key. And just having that trust it is, is important. Yes. yes. To get the look, get the picture. Yeah. You never forget when people trust you. Wow. Wow. And I mean, you've been in the industry for so long. Like, what would you say has been you know, the key to your success over the years and just remaining relevant even. I mean, you've written books, you know, over the course of your, your career, you've worked with different brands and you're still here. You're still, people are still looking to you for beauty advice. Like how did that? I think I got that from my mother. Uh, my mother, Joan Fuller, she's Australian. She always kept herself in tip top shape. She was a a ballroom dancer. She was an ice skater. She loved makeup, but she didn't know how to do it. So I would do her makeup as a teenager. And as a teenager, she gave me all that confidence, mm. you know, because she was beautiful and she kept herself in good shape. And so she was a great role model for me. And you don't have to be beautiful. You just have to take care of yourself. Hmm. And she would always say, take care of yourself because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Wow. You never know when you'll get a break or, you know, things like that. Wow. That's so amazing advice. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, like after... I <laughs> she, said it. she never said that, but I got that from how yeah. she acted and how she treated her life. Well, I don't know, Sandy. You are surrounded by beautiful friends, beautiful people. Beautiful. <laughs> my, my entire life, I've been surrounded by nothing but beautiful people. And I think that has to rub off on you. It has to make <laughs> Because the truth is, there is just as beautiful on the inside. Absolutely. You know, Christy Brinkley, Elizabeth Hurley, both of them I still see, ex except for COVID. Because yeah, uh, COVID. But uh, yeah, most of the people I know who are beautiful are just as beautiful on the inside. It's I love that. And do you still hang out with Carol Alt? Is Miss Carol still her? <laughs> I still Carol did something so amazing for me two years ago. I did a class in Portland, Oregon. Wow! Without telling me, she showed up on stage. And started talking about me. And I wow. Believe it. She had hooked up with the, the person who was throwing this event for makeup artists in Portland, Oregon, hooked up with Carol and said, would you, you know, be so kind as to go on stage and talk about Sandy and her work? And she spoke <laughs> about Gia because Carol used to work with Gia. 
Ah. And so, you know, there was a connection there. And, um, and it was really it was shocking. It was like, oh, my God, Carol. So she's the best. And she's I amazing. follow everyone really closely on Instagram. And so even if I don't see them, I see them. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, her hair is just like, raw, raw, she eats raw food. Her skin is impeccable. She has the the skin quality. She's got to be almost 60. Her skin quality is that of a 30 year old. And, you know, I've never spoken to her if she's had any work done. But you would never see it. You would never. You would know. never know. And and that's the beauty about. I mean, ca- let's put Carol all aside because I don't know that she's done anything. And she she's fabulous. Beautiful. She just looks fabulous. Just fabulous and yeah. healthy and everything. She's a good person. Absolutely. But talking about you know arriving at a certain age, maybe in my mid thirties or early thirties. I thought, Oh, my lips are too small. My lips are too small, but they hadn't invented collagen yet. Oh my God. <laughs> so I had to wait another, maybe almost 10 years before they invented what. I oh was my goodness. For. So, you know, and then once I discovered that I could change something I did, but You know, there's cautionary advice because we all see the girls that started too early. I mean, you know, they look beautiful, but they're only 19 and they've already done so much. You worry about when they need some work done and they're 35, 38 years old, what they'll be able to do. So there is a point where it is too early. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I love your book, Makeup Wake. Uh, yeah. What, yes. Yes. I mean, I know you're like, oh, I wrote it so long ago. But honestly. 2010. I mean. That was it's bad. so good, though. It's so good. I, and what I well, loved I about it. Some of the uh, products might not be available. Anymore. Oh, yes. That's all I meant. But, you know, Dior show's still there. You know, like the classics. Right. But, you know, what I loved about it at least for me as a 35 year old, you know, mother of two, you know, in quarantine. (laughs) Beautiful skin you have. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, that means a lot. Ah! Yes. Makeup, wake up, go get it. You guys go get it. It's such a great read. And honestly, it just inspired me to take better care of my skin and to really think about the different parts, like even the eyebrows, like I'm like, Oh, you know, maybe I could look into getting an eyebrow gel. I didn't even know that eyebrow gel was like a thing. I never paid attention to it in such a way, but like really going through different parts of the face and, and also the, the end, like towards the end where you have the doctors and the experts, you know, talk about the different procedures, either, you know, getting a procedure or using a product instead of the procedure, but things to think about really destigmatized that whole idea for me, which I I loved. I really love that. I mean, if you want something done to correct something on your face, do it. If you feel, you know, because aging is really weird. Some people age perfectly symmetrical, but most people don't. One side of the face ages quicker than the other. So if you need Botox to help lift up your brow or keep your up, do it. Who cares? (laughs) As long as you go to somebody reputable and you look great. Yeah. I think it's a fabulous way to share beauty is to talk about dermatological procedures that, like I said, were not available to me when I was 35 years old. Wow. Wow. You know, you've done all kinds of faces over the years and you know the beauty industry over time has expanded into more shades and colors and you know what are your thoughts and and sort of that transition for the industry and you do all kinds of faces like how were you able to transition into different skin tones and types over time well 
I don't, I, I think people have a misconception about the 70s. Okay, mm. so don't forget the 70s. We came from the 1960s. If you look at the supermodels from the 1960s and you look at Naomi Sims mm. and, and you look at the way she was made up, I mean, we always had stage makeup. We always had like a, there was a, a place called Il Maquillage on 59th Street in Lexington. We, with fabulous range of makeup, she used to do Diana Ross. I wow. mean, you know, so there was always theatrical makeup because there were always beautiful black women working on stage and theater. And mm. I used to use their makeup if I could, buy, and Il Maquillage repackaged it so that all makeup artists could buy it. Uh, wow. A lady who ran Il Maquillage, Elena Harkavi, I think her name was, was a makeup artist. So she got the stage makeup and she made it usable for makeup artists. So that was in the 70s. So wow. people do think we had nothing. Right. <laughs> true. Most makeup, I will say most makeup companies had 10 shades of makeup, okay? <laughs> but when you went out of the box, you could find ah. everybody. So I makes total sense. always shop out of the box. So we were never hurting for, uh, you know, I shouldn't say we were never hurting. I was never hurting. You That's right. <laughs> you know, and when <laughs> have a trip to Europe I found the banana powder and I found all kinds of things that weren't in the U.S. yet wow uh, Iman is correct when she says but you see most makeup lines went for 10 shades yeah she's correct and there would be some makeup artists that thought that was just fine but no, not me. <laughs> that was You're me. like, no, I am Sandy Linter. I found the makeup. <laughs> Seek out. You, there was also a company called Fashion Fair. Yes, uh, yes. Fashion Fair is a very old company. Uh, for 40 years. My mom wore Fashion Fair. <laughs> so beautiful it, it wasn't readily available the shades were not readily available the way they are today but you could find them yeah yes absolutely so you know you've done all kinds of faces all kinds of people what is the common mistake that people make with their makeup routines like what do you see and you're just like oh god no so here's the biggest mistake. Uh, every now and then I'll do a makeup lesson and the woman will come back to me like a month later for me to critique what she's done. And <laughs> I can't see any makeup at all. <laughs> so what, what's happened is that women in their 50s have gotten intimidated by using makeup and I feel really badly for them I want them to feel more free and more able to use makeup and so when I make them up and I use a very light hand they lighten that hand to the point where they think they're wearing makeup but you can't it's not enhancing them because you can't mm. tell I mean at all and I think the makeup wake up done for women over 50 in 2010 books like that free the women up i said oh well i can still wear contour if i need to and yeah. i'm 60 years old well if you need to wear it and just these are the colors you should wear etc cetera, etc cetera. there's no i think there was this uh rule like, you can't wear eyeshadow if you're over 50. I mean, things oh. like that. Now, I understand if your eye is wrinkled, don't wear the eyeshadow. Wear the eyeliner. Curl your eyelashes. Wear mascara. So there are things you can do to detract from the wrinkles. And you should Absolutely. know about it. And you should do it because it makes you look great all day long. And I, I love your videos because it's just like... 
it's like you're having so much fun and you're like, no matter what age you are, have fun with that eyeshadow. And you're like, mm, ah, that sparkled. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you see, all mistakes are there. I don't really edit anything. I, I will try to get better at, at actually filming it because I go out of frame too often. But um, yeah, because when people do their makeup, they have to know if you make a mistake, don't take it all off. Adjust it. You have to know how to manipulate it so that it's wow. Perfect. You know what I mean? That's a life lesson, Sandy. Everybody makes it. <laughs> you know? So you just like, come on, you take your little Q-tip and you adjust it. With the tip, with that, with that, pointy. the tip, the pointy tips. I, I learned that. I was like, ooh, I need to get that. on your eyelashes. Ah. Oh. Love it. So, you know, you look fabulous and you are a woman of a certain age, but you're just hip and cool and modern. Who are you wearing right now? Like, who are your favorite designers? Like, who are you into? So, so I'm very petite. Um, I know you know Lauren Izerski, and she's Love a, her. Not, I do too. She's a friend of mine. She's a neighbor. And she wears designer clothing beautifully. She's tall and thin. Well, I'm five feet one, five feet two. <laughs> I weigh 90 pounds. I go to all the sample sales. The size twos and the zeros go first. Yep, sure I'm do. stuck with the sixes, and they don't really fit my body. I love the Moschino sample sales, and yes. I'll go there every year, uh, twice a year and et cetera. But it's hard for me to actually get something short enough for me because I'm really short and really petite. So I buy clothes off the rack. I like rag and bone. They have good, mm -hmm. well-fitting, skinny pants. I like Alice and Olivia. Again, yeah. they, do, they do really nice, colorful clothes for small people and um, I recently purchased a suit in leopard, leopard jacket and leopard skinny pants. <gasps> and I love it. I did, a oh. Mac, I did a Mac class wearing that. So I can still have um, fun with fashion, but I'm not heavily like Lauren is into designer, <laughs> you know, Galliano and this and that. And she wears it so beautifully. I mean, you should have seen the way she looked the other day at the Brooklyn Museum. Oh, oh, I saw her Instagram. Um, I said, okay. <laughs> no. So. Amazing. Well, you look great. And that leopard suit sounds absolutely uh, like beyond. I'll again. I'll wear it again one day. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Love it. So, you know, this is a fashion moment and we have to ask, what is your favorite fashion moment of all time? It can be professional, personal, or both. Totally up to you. Um, I loved, I think it was around 1980, 1980, no, 1977. And Claude Mantana came out with leather jackets that was studded and the shoulders were out to <laughs> near high. And I mean, it really, and I had a per one in purple with a matching purple skirt, leather, and it was so beautiful. And the colors just made me, you know, that was so inspiring for my makeup. And I remember that moment in 1977. That really rocked it for me. I'd never seen anything like it. I didn't live through the 40s when they had the big shoulders, but he did them extraordinarily big. And I happened to have a big round face. So it went well with the shoulders. <laughs> that was a moment. <laughs> a fabulous face. <laughs> Oh, Sandy, you are absolutely amazing. Like, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with us and to share your story. You know, your time with Gia, amazing, but also just the course of your career and what you've contributed to beauty and fashion is truly appreciated. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. 
Now it's time for my favorite segment where we get to hear from you, our listeners, about your favorite fashion moments. It's Renee and I'm from New York City. My favorite fashion moment was when I sat in the front row at the Timo Weiland fashion show in 2013. It was then I realized, or at least I felt as if I made it. Sitting in the front row for someone who loves fashion is magical. And having done so for the first time, just set the stage for my love of fashion and creativity. That's my story. Hi, I'm Ashley calling from Kentucky. My favorite fashion moment is Michelle Obama in the Versace copper colored chainmail dress at the last state ball she attended as first lady. She looked incredible. All her curves were hugged and out and she just sent us off with a bang, literally. This is Brienne um, calling from Brooklyn, and one of my favorite fashion moments was attending the very last show of Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week at Bryant Park. It was the Tommy Hilfiger show in the tent, and I remember being there and realizing that 7th on 6th was moving on to uh, a new home, and it was truly the end of an era, and all of that had been accomplished to bring all of Fashion Week to one centralized place um, and truly grateful to have been able to be there to see it. My name is Erin Patton from Houston, Texas, and my ultimate fashion moment was the Narciso Rodriguez Spring 2009 show at the Tents in Bryant Park. I just happened to get hooked up in the most major way and I was sitting front row and as I was sitting front row, I started to strike up a conversation with a beautiful woman next to me and we just were chatting and I was like, by the way, what's your name? And she says, oh, my name is Glenda Bailey. And of course, at the time, Glenda was the editor in chief at Harper's Bazaar. And I was like, whoa. And then literally as I looked to my right, you know, just in awe of my surroundings, I literally see none other than the Kanye West with his new boo, Amber Rose, sitting next to him. And we were literally almost like across the aisle from each other. We could lit- we could look at each other. We were looking at each other. It was amazing. And then that's when like all the lights dimmed and I didn't even get a chance to say anything back to Glenda because I was just like, oh, you mean from Harper's Bazaar? And she was like, yes. You know, in her beautiful British accent. And, you know, that could have been my opportunity maybe to have my Devil Wears Prada moment, but certainly didn't take her up on that opportunity. I was in the midst of my personal shopping journey at Bergdorf Goodman, which was an amazing one. And I just will never forget it. The collection was so beautiful. It was his bright neon colors. I mean, honestly, I don't even remember people doing this before him, but he was doing the cutouts kind of like on the on the um, waist, around the waist. It was just amazing. So that was my fashion moment. Thanks so much for joining me for this week of A Fashion Moment. If you like what you hear, we'd love for you to join our community of listeners and spread the word about the show. We also want to hear from you. Share your favorite fashion moments and dream guests with us by sending an audio clip or email to a fashion moment podcast at gmail.com. Or you can tag us on Instagram at a fashion moment and you could be featured on next week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review and let us know what you think. Until then, see you next time for another fashion moment. Podcast production by Rebecca Rashid and John Taylor Williams. Digital media production by Megan Porras. 
This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Patrick Patrickios for their song, Hot Coffee.